Fine. <laughs> Welcome to Movie Life Crisis. Join us as we watch the best movies from 30 years ago. One of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, or dog house in this area. Put that gun down! I didn't kill my wife! Harrison Ford is the fugitive. Ready for Opens PGT. August 6th. Call 777 Film for advanced tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I left that oh, in man. there for you. I left the phone number. That's great. That's great. That, that is an amazing trailer. Yeah. Um, they said the name. You heard uh, Dep- Deputy Marshal Samuel Gerard do his thing. Uh, you know what to expect going into that movie. I like it. Did you read the thing about they – because they shot this movie it, sequentially. They shot it in the order that it, it ended up being in, which they don't do a lot. Yeah, I was going to say that. They don't normally do that. Yeah, and they um, – and this was like they were writing a script every morning before they shot the scenes, and they yeah, made so Tommy great. Lee do that speech because they're like, "We got a tight window. We're going to put this movie out. We need this speech for the trailer." So, like, he did it twice. He did it one time for the movie, and he did it one time for the trailer. And that's, you can tell that version we just heard yeah, the trailer is not the one that was in the movie. Yeah, I, I heard that, and I was like, maybe I'm just mi- like misremembering it. No, no, that's awesome. That's the version he did just for that because they said like the the trailer version is just him. There's no other actors. It's just like extras and stuff. Yeah, and so, dude, and I he was, really and he I was it's in like the sixth day of filming. He's like, we don't even know what this movie. We don't have an ending. We don't even know what we're doing here. And they're like, it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. And he's like, okay, here here you go. I guess. Yeah, dude, but I think uh, everything I read is him and Harrison Ford were like ad libbing so many lines. Yeah, that like he by the end he was like, this is cool. I want to make movies like this from now on. I I also want him to make movies like this because this yeah. is fantastic. He was really great. Um, I wonder if U.S. Marshals was anything like this. <laughs> we'll find out in uh, five years, uh, maybe. <laughs> if I'm still here. If, if we do that movie. Uh, 98's got some good movies. Yeah, movie Life Crisis, Season 3, Episode 17, The Fugitive. Wow. 17, already. Can't believe it. I can't believe it. We are... Time finds when your heaven flies. <laughs> <laughs> We're cruising through 1993 movies. Uh, I'm JT here with Jeff. Just a quick reminder for those of us who may be new, which is not me and Jeff, but maybe listening. We're rewatching movies that came out 30 years ago, um, and we're 17 episodes into our list of 1993 releases here with an absolute banger, The Fugitive. It is fantastic. Dude, that, I mean, I remember it. I'm not saying I didn't remember it. Yeah. But it was really good still. Yeah, dude. And I like it, that. Well, I was, uh, I was, they did some, um, I love when they do like 20 year oral history. We talked to everybody who's in the movie, and they did that for this. Uh, yeah. Like, Two months ago, there was one on Rolling Stone. I read the whole thing, and it's like, and they were talking about rewatching the movie because the director is rewatching it to like kind of remaster it for a digital thirty year release. Nice. And they were going like, not only did the movie like they like you talk about how well a movie aged, but like this one really didn't age. If it released now, it would still be just as good. Just as good. Like yeah. you, fi- you fix a couple of things. You get rid of a couple of rotary phones yeah, and you, some fax machines, and you're yeah. golden. Dude, you get rid of some pay phones and some fax machines, and you absolutely could put this out yeah. right in August of 2023 and it, with Harrison Ford starring in it, and it would outperform Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. I think it would, too. Which it, I, but which you I know what? I, I got to be honest. I, I think it's Tommy Lee. That's, like Harrison Ford did a great job, but Tommy Lee Jones was killing it. I know, man. He's so good. This is the best Tommy Lee Jones in the – and uh even and I think than from Men in Black? The, well, dude, I was going to say, I think this Tommy Lee Jones... So he does Under Siege, and then he does this, both with the same director, uh, Eddie right. Davis. And I think the success of really this, because he wins the Oscar, is like, yeah. oh, hey, I can just do that in all the movies. I can just be like, talk really fast, be really sarcastic, Tommy Lee Jones, and yeah. then like everything will be great. Yeah. So I think this informs all that Men in Black like, and all the stuff he does after this. Yeah, and he's really, really good at that. Dude, he's great at that. Really good at it. The whole, dude, him and Men in Black just, because he's like, not snarky, but just straight to the point. Dude, and he's, he's, he's really at, witty and he's super yeah. fast. He's just super quick. Yeah. He's like, listen, don't let anybody make fun of your ponytail. <laughs> like, he's just throwing stuff like that out the whole movie. I was like, God, that's good. Yeah, he is. He's um, awesome. Also, really 
really quickly, uh, thank you guys for listening to the main feed, The Fugitive. We also do bonus movies over on Patreon where we're going through 1989 releases. We just released uh, Field of Dreams, and then we've also done Uncle Buck, Batman, Indiana Jones, and The Last Crusade, speaking of Harrison Ford. Nice. So uh, thanks so much to everybody who's supporting on Patreon. If you want extra movies uh, or if you want to support us, that's the way to do it. Uh, If you're not, then we got free movies coming to you right here in 1993. Moving into 94, we just started looking at the 94 list, and holy hell, it's going to be also amazing. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's so hard to, like, narrow it down. Like, we yeah. still have 93 movies that I want to—I don't think we're going to get to. I know. We're doing 26 or t- probably about 26, 27 movies a year every two weeks, and every year we're going— there's, like, three or four movies that we didn't get to do that I would have liked to have done. Yeah, maybe we can come up with something at the end of the year, a lightning round or something. Uh, we've talked about doing some like lightning round stuff. Uh, yeah. Really, I think the answer is the more support we get, the more we go like, hey, that's, let's make some extra stuff because we can pay people to help us with stuff. Yeah, that's, make the, more that's content. the big thing. Yeah, that's the big thing. Um, yeah, man. So, uh, talk about why this movie was chosen. It's the number three movie of the year. It's fantastic. It was so then. Good. It is still now. Do you consider this a thriller? Like, I think did, so, right? Did you, you remembered who done it, and you remember how it ended, or no? Um, I didn't. I was saying, like, I kind of guessed it, but I didn't remember for sure. Like, yeah. I think the twist still kind of worked for me. I was like, oh, it did. It, it worked like, for I, me. I kind of remembered the guy, you know, the the his friend being actually the guy, but I forgot that it was like, oh, it's actually the pharmaceutical industry that put this whole thing together. I was like, damn, that's really prescient. Thirty years yeah. later, now that yeah, we all know is. pharmaceutical companies are evil as shit. Yeah, I, I remember the, the one-armed man being the guy who did it, but he was, like, paid, but I couldn't remember how, how the drop came, and that, that's yeah. why I liked it. It still worked. Yeah, dude, that's absolutely. Good. Well, uh, give good. us a synopsis. Uh, yeah, this is an AI synopsis. Uh, the Fugitive, 1993, uh, is a gripping thriller about Dr. Richard Kimball, played by Harrison Ford, who was wrongfully convicted of his wife's murder. After escaping custody, he becomes a fugitive. Uh, in quotes, <laughs> relentlessly pursued by U.S. Marshal Samuel Gerard, pr- uh, portrayed by Tommy Lee Jones. As Kimball searches for the real killer to clear his name, a high-stakes game of cat and mouse unfolds, leading to intense action and suspense. Yeah. yeah. Do you think this is a thriller? Uh, yeah, I, I did. Because, I, I, again, I really thought something else the whole time going in. The one-armed man did it. That's, what, uh, I, like, that's the thing I remembered from this, and I was like, yeah, I remember him. Let's yep. get him. And then it wasn't him. I mean, it was him, but it wasn't him. Yeah, he was a, he was the weapon. But right. yeah, well, it's one of the things I think is cool about this movie is it is a thriller. I mean, the, I have in my notes like this thing's basically a two-hour chase scene, which is one of the reasons why it's so awesome. But it's also like a, it's also a mystery, like during the chase. Like that's so good. It's like a mystery wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a question. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like that. Um, Forty-four million dollar budget, grossed three hundred and sixty-eight million dollars. Jeez, so. they did all right. They did pretty well. It's like a eight and a half or nine x multiplier. That's not bad. That's, That's not ridiculous. bad. Yeah, they, third biggest movie of the year behind Jurassic Park, which is way out in front, and then Mrs. Doubtfire, which we will also do uh, on this podcast uh, in the fall. Nice. Yeah, yeah, and this came out August in August, yeah. so we're right in the we're right in the spot, dude. We're dead on. We're dead on the actual thirtieth anniversary. That's pretty cool. Well, the August release was one of the reasons why this movie was so hard to make because they didn't have much of Harrison Ford's time. Like they just they were starting to shoot at the end of the last year and they but they knew that their august like we, they're like we got harrison ford he's the one of the biggest movie stars in the world we're releasing august 6th and we're going to start promoting in february so even though we don't have a movie we're definitely going to be out by this point in time um that's pretty bold considering they didn't have the script written yet no so that, that's everyone was like we were just like trying to jam through this thing we had only so much time with harrison ford we had we're filming in chicago we had to deal with the actual weather like, but we knew we could not miss our day because Warner Brothers, you know, when movies, when studios release a big tentpole film, they like elbow everybody off, else off of that date. It's like, oh, Fugitive's out this weekend. We're going to do Striking Distance. We're going to push it a month because we don't want to compete. <laughs> Wait, Striking Distance wasn't a tentpole movie? Striking Distance is the movie that knocked this movie out of the number one slot after it had been out for four weeks. Really? Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So that wasn't like a, that wasn't like a hypothetical. That actually is what happened. Bruce Willis's. <laughs> Striking distance took this movie out of the number one spot. Number that's one spot. awesome. That is yeah. awesome. And I still don't think I've seen it. I mean, I felt like I've seen it. It had a lot of uh, Jewish people in it, right? Yeah, it did. Yeah. <laughs> Protected by uh, Liam Neeson. 
Uh, the incomparable Oscar Schindler. The incomparable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, dude, awards. You you said it earlier. Uh, for the bunch, Academy Awards? A whole bunch of awards. Yeah, man. Be- Best Supporting Actor, Tommy Lee Jones. He freaking killed it. Yeah. I uh, got nominated for Best Picture, Best Editing, Best Score, Best Sound, Best Sound Effects. Like, it was... It got a gambit of a whole bunch of stuff uh, nominated. Um like different random smaller uh, awards, they they won a ton of those. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Uh, a bunch of them are best supporting actor for Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah. Like Golden Globe, he won best performance by an actor in a supporting role. Like killed it. Yeah, uh, that's why. I, and to be honest, I think that's why when you continue going and you go with U.S. Marshals, you don't bring back Harrison Ford. You don't need him. You just got Tommy Lee Jones. You could, dude. I, I feel confident they could make another one of those right now with Tommy Lee Jones. I think if I this, I think if the sequel had been better, they maybe would have made more. Because um, and we, we'll get into that because there are interesting stories about the sequel. Like, why did it take five years? Like they, they knew during the filming of this movie that there might be a sequel because I got yeah. some funny stories about that. And Harrison Ford was saying like during the filming, he's like. Like like Joey Pantaleono, like Joey Pants was like, dude, Joey you can't kill me off. There might be a sequel. And Harrison Ford's like, you're not going to be a sequel. And he's like, why not? He's like, because I'm not going to be in it. And Joey Pants just goes, well, who cares? We'll just get some other $20 million asshole and we'll chase him through the woods. <laughs> and Harrison Ford just like fell over laughing. Uh, oh, freaking Joey Pants. I love him. They do him and him and Tommy Lee together. Yeah. Killing it. Yeah. So, Killing dude, it. I would have loved if they would have done a better job with the second one and they actually could have made... Because it's just, yeah, the Marshalls is just like an ensemble cast where they're all just clowning and pushing each other in the bushes and saying funny stuff. Yeah. Like they could have just kept, they could have just kept plugging in leading men and chasing them right. and fine with that. Who was in the second one? Uh, Wesley, Wesley Snipes, Snipes, right? Yeah. yeah. Dude, I didn't think that one was bad. It's not didn't bad. It, it had Iron Man in it too, right? Yeah, it when had the, Robert Downey Jr. That was like his, Robert Downey Jr. was, that was the first movie that kind of got him back into a big movie. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Remember he breaks the sunglasses to get out of the thing? Yeah. Oh, I want to watch that now. Dude, well, I, in five years, it'll be on the podcast. Maybe. I'll wait for it. I'll wait uh, for it. <laughs> 2028. Mark your Tw- calendars. 2028. Jesus. Um, <laughs> yeah, dude. Sequels, spinoffs, also uh, U.S. Marshals. We U.S. Marshals. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there was also a lady that wrote a uh, paperback novel of the film using the thing uh, that did really well, better than they thought the book was going to do. Oh, nice. Like, the she used this book, script. Novelization of this movie. Of the movie, yes. Nice. Of the script. And and then, of course, this movie is based on a TV show set TV in the show. 60s that yeah. ran for four seasons. And that TV show is itself based on a real story that happened to a, um, a doctor in the 50s in Cleveland who uh, was a surgeon who was arrested and convicted for killing his wife. And then after being in prison for 10 years, uh, he got exonerated and released. No, just in time. Ten years. What do you? Yeah, and like, then and then do they three, try to give him money when they release him, and it's been ten years? Uh, I don't know because this is in the this would have been in the sixties, so probably not. Uh, but Man, then this, the really shitty thing is after so he he lost his wife, he lost his reputation, he spent ten years in prison, and then when he got out of prison, uh, he died three years later. So, Man, so it sucks he, for that guy because if he yeah. was still alive, he could be making fugitive money. <laughs> he totally could. Uh, do, I, I do have um, Leslie Nielsen in the uh, parody film Wrongfully Accused. That was heavily based on this movie. Nice. It's like I've, Naked Gun, but like <laughs> The Fugitive. I've never seen that, but I do love Leslie Nielsen. Dude, it's way good. They also uh, talk about Mission Impossible and Titanic in that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, real quick, this series finale of The Fugitive in 1967, the TV yeah. show, was watched by 78 million people. Holy hell, that's a lot. Which is a ridiculous number of people to watch a TV show. So. I mean, I, I remember this, bit, like my grandpa and my dad talking about like, yeah. oh, I think that was, a big, that was a big TV show back then when this movie came out. It was definitely big. That's crazy. That's awesome. 78 million is a lot. Yeah. How did, how did they even do that back then? Like, what do you mean? Niel- Nielsen ratings? You just had like the little box on your TV and... I think in the I think in the sixties they didn't there wasn't like a box I think they actually they actually called like they would do for political polls like called you and went like what did you guys watch tonight I think they actually did it by phone Oh my god they would never it'd be zero for everything if <laughs> if you called now nobody answers their phone my phone rings I'm like uh oh somebody got kidnapped I don't know <laughs> I'm not answering that Yeah I thought you were gonna say that'd be zeros because everyone's watching different stuff It's like oh, oh I'm watching. Well, yeah. uh, I'm watching no, Blippi, and it's too. like I'm watching something on Twitch, and it's like I'm on TikTok, and it's like no one's yeah. watching TV. 
But see, like now, they just, that's how they do it now, right? You can just tell what's been streamed so that... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's how they do it now. That's um, great. 78 million. Jeez, yeah. that's so much. Do you remember when and where you first saw this? Uh, I do. I definitely do. This was in the mall theater in Hammond. Yeah. Because uh, I can remember um, saying, well, yeah, we can go to Kukos. And my dad giving me the, yeah, we have Kukos at home. Like, <laughs> d- he didn't... <laughs> the canned response of, no, we have that at home. Um I also am that person who tries to guess what's going to happen. Uh, and unfortunately for the people in the movies with me, I am never, not not never right, but very rarely right. And this was definitely one where I was like, I think the guy with the one arm did it. It's all his fault. And my dad's going, I don't know. It might be somebody else. And I'm like, no, you're wrong. Like I can remember getting it wrong uh, in the theater. Uh, so yeah, it was mall theater. Hammond. Nice. Uh yeah. Shout out Chimmy Dogs from the original Cuckoos and Hammond. Maybe yeah. not the originals, but I think they uh, so, the original for us. They're original as far as I'm concerned. I don't know who <laughs> yeah. else would have thought of that. No one else uh, served tortillas with cheese, meat, and vegetables before them. Uh, <laughs> I think you're putting quotes around that word meat. It's doing a lot of heavy lifting. It's a hot dog. <laughs> I, uh, I'm positive that I rented this because I don't think... Uh, there was nothing. There's no reason I couldn't have watched this at 13. So I think that as soon as it came out on VHS, if it released in August in theaters, maybe Christmas, it came out on VHS. And I'm sure I rented it. Yeah. Remember Blockbuster? Like they charged you extra money for the new releases. Like it cost yeah, like another that, dollar. And I was like, I don't care. Yeah, I gotta, we got to watch that. It's going to be awesome. That sucks really bad. Speaking of which, did you hear Netflix is finally shutting down their uh, DVD rental mail yeah. to your house? Yeah. They're finally yeah. shutting her down. Yeah. Pour a little bit out for my dead homie. Uh, who's Who's still doing that? Uh, dude, there's apparently a lot of people because they're all upset and they said randomly they're going to choose people to send 10 extra discs to that you just keep forever. Great. <laughs> what do I even do with that? Hang it from my rearview mirror? Like, I don't yeah. I have anything to play a DVD yeah. anymore. Use it as coasters? I have no method of playing a DVD unless my PlayStation will play a DVD, but it'll barely play PlayStation, so I don't know if it'll can work. You, can you do that thing where you put it on a, a table and then cover it with that clear lacquer and then make a really cool uh, 90s uh, coffee table? Yeah, you probably could. Wait a, wait a second. Do your kids know what happens if you put a blank CD in the microwave? Uh, my kids do, but that's only because they're my kids. <laughs> My students have no idea, but we'll have to show them tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> I have a microwave at the, at the school. I can show them. Yes. All right. That's awesome. Okay. So uh, <laughs> how do you rate this? Uh, one to ten. One to ten chimmy dogs. No sevens. No sevens. Um, dude, I, I gave it an eight and a half. Yeah. Great plot. Well acted. Um, even though, it, like, you, like we said, it's billed as a thriller. Like, I don't feel like it's only a thriller. Yeah, like I thought it was funny. I thought it was, uh, I don't know, I just liked it. I didn't know where it was going originally, and I had a little trouble this time because it's been so long since I watched it. Like, I forgot about the dude, yeah. the, the friend. Yeah, I um, thought it was, a really, it was a really smart, the twists and turns. Um, I got an 8 out of 10. I actually thought about 8.5, and, and I landed on 8. It's, it's, dude, it's Slave Miserables. Like, they were taught, when they made this movie, before they even had a script, everyone was like, yeah, it's, it's Les Miserables. He's, there's a wrongfully imprisoned hero who's chased by Inspector, Inspector nice. Javert. Just, there's no singing, but otherwise, it's, it's Les Miserables. But it's just it's nice. a two-hour chase movie with mystery mixed in. Tommy Lee Jones is incredible. Harrison Ford is Harrison Ford. Like, he's just always good. But. Did it not feel like real, though? Like yeah. it, it felt like, um, I don't know, man. Like it wasn't, it didn't seem... Uh, polished. I don't know how to explain it. Like, remember well, dude, when he goes? It's, it's they like it's practical effects. They're shooting on location. There's no sets. It's in Chicago. Yeah, yeah. I think that's like, what and makes I think it because better. like all the U.S. Marshals, like because they're they're because they're struggling to get the thing scripted. Anything, any dialogue that didn't directly have to do with the plot, they could just make up. So all of the U.S. Marshals' interactions is all, it's almost all improv. So it feels that's like great. a group of people who actually are working together because yeah, it's a group awesome. of actors who are working together making up dialogue. That's what I was going to say. Like when they're like talking about stuff, the small things that they're throwing at each other, that's great, man. Well, dude, think about when we did Cadence and just all of the, all the, all the yeah, convicts just yeah, talking. Yeah. Like, they're just talking. That's how they talk, and that's what the movie captured. And you're like, that's, you could never have written that. Yeah. I mean, someone great. maybe could have, but I, I, most people cannot write that. Yeah, I mean, I'm even talking about, like, small things. Like, what are you doing? I'm thinking. Think me up yeah. a cup of coffee. Like, that that's kind of That's what I'm stuff. saying. Like, they're, they're, that's them talking to each other. That's great, man. That's so good. 
So yeah, eight and a half Good out of stuff. ten for you. Eight for me. Dude, I it's like great. That. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, really great. The, the the music got a lot of love in the awards, and I actually uh, maybe just because it was too loud when I was listening to it, but I was like, man, this music is. I wish it was down a little bit. Um, I don't really remember the music that much. It got all kinds of awards, and the it got an Academy Award nomination, and the and the composer was like was saying before the movie came out, I was like, I think I really phoned that in. I think I screwed it up. It's going to be terrible. <laughs> uh, because that's how everybody felt about this movie. Yeah, the, everybody involved was like, we may never work again. I think that's going to be horrible. <laughs> and at the end, like, oh, never mind. It was awesome. Everyone loved it. We made a pile of money. Oh, man. Oh, that's great. That's really great. Yeah, dude. Uh, all right. Let's, let's do... Let's hit the best. Yeah, let's do the best, man. Best three scenes. Uh, what's your first? Uh, my first one is when uh, Harrison Ford is running away. I mean, he's running away the whole time, but like he's running <laughs> away. Say, you have to be a little bit more specific. <laughs> he's running away in an ambulance and goes into a tunnel, and uh, they bring the helicopter down outside yeah. of the tunnel, uh, and he like uh, sneaks away, and they try to come from both sides, and they meet in the middle, all the U.S. Marshals, and they're like, what the hell? Where is he? He's like, I didn't see him. And they realize that he went down into the uh, water drainage yeah. uh, thing. Uh, that whole scene is fantastic. Um, he drops, Gerard drops his gun and then he friggin spoiler. He jumps over the edge head first, by the way. What was that? Yeah. Is he, that the he, best way to do that? <laughs> he does a full Peter Pan. Um, oh dude, uh, there's a, like there's a slanted wall that he you think, might you, you not think you clear down like a water slide. <laughs> well, no, just go feet first to give yourself a chance. He's jumping head first, arms by his side. Maybe yeah. that's just how the mannequin fell, but like <laughs> he like no, jumped. that's uh, the the effects in this movie are phenomenal. I don't know how that was accomplished, but I will say that was the one moment. That's the one thing in this movie that you go like he definitely would have died. There's no chance he lives through that. Yeah, that, head first is definitely the reason too. <laughs> like I don't know how shallow it is right there, but dude, he went head first, and I was like, what is what an idiot. Uh, but that whole interaction with him, that's got one of my lines in it that I didn't kill my wife. Like that whole – dude. Yeah, it's, a, it's got it's great quotes. Scene. It's also got – it's hard, man, because there's so many good quotes just from the marshals talking to each other. Like that's the one where uh, freaking Joey Pants is like, I mean, I just bought these shoes. And they're like, shut up. Get in there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, dude, what is not to love about Joey Pants? I can't wait. <laughs> Captain, maybe it was Captain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Marcus, I know what it's called. I'm the captain. I'm supposed to know what it's called. Ah, <laughs> oh, God, what a what a genius. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's fantastic. my first one. That's good. I got that one as well. Um, the jump into the river. The, the there's just dude, they're throwing out jargon. Half of it's made up, half of it's real. Like, like yeah. they see that he's gone down the uh that whatever drain and Tommy Lee just yells out, we got to go for <laughs> like, I don't think that's real. Uh, that's like definitely US not a Marshall. thing, uh, that, but that's what I'm saying. Like, did Tommy Lee Jones just come up with that on the spot? Yeah. Th- that seems so. like a Tommy Lee Jones thing. Yeah. There's some good oral histories about this that, uh, and I think there's some, cause it's 30 years later, everybody's going like, well, he said he made that up, but I remember that was in the, like this, the, one of the original screenwriters was like, I guess Tommy Lee had said at some point that he wrote the I want a hard target search of every doghouse, outhouse, and house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's like, he didn't write that. That was in my original draft before the production even started, like back in 92. Like yeah. it's tweaked slightly. But now everyone is kind of saying like, hey, look, it was a team effort. We all, the writers wrote some stuff. And then on this, on the shoot, we would kind of tweak things a little bit. And Yeah. So, but the it's hard I, to pin down who wrote what at this point. Right. And the thing I was reading was like, it didn't sound more like, Oh, Tommy Lee Jones was winging it while the camera was running. It was more of a, hey, let's write this together. Okay, I got it. Now let's turn the camera on and I got it. Like, he's making it up for some of it. Like, maybe he, he, we got a gopher, is that? But I, I, I was reading, like, okay, that morning they got together and wrote, like, all right, what are we going to do today? What would be the next step? Where yeah. would he go? Yeah, and they're doing a lot crazy. of that. Like, the, the actors and the director – and the writer are all working together before the scene, before the scene is shot to come up with it. The, like they said that in that scene, right? He's, I didn't kill my wife. And Tommy Lee Jones, I don't care. Like, yeah. That was the line that was in the script. And Tommy Lee Jones is going like, I don't, I don't like that. I don't want to say that. So he's like, let me try a bunch of different stuff. And Harrison Ford's like, I'm like nut deep in freezing cold water. Let's just do the, I don't care. Right. But and yeah, originally it was, that isn't my problem. And Tommy Lee Jones changed it to, I don't care. That's how I read it. Yeah, I, uh, I didn't read that, but that may be what happened. But the but the point was like Tommy Lee Jones was talking to whatever the person from the U.S. Marshals that was advising him on the movie was like, 
It was like the thing you have to understand from the marshal's point of view is that we don't care if the person is guilty or innocent. We just have to hunt them down. So like that's Bring what that is in. supposed right. to convey. That line is like right. whether or not you're innocent is not my job. It's just you're running and not my job is to bring you in. That's that's what you're supposed to say. I don't care. And that's that's how that's how you can tell he's a good actor though too is because it totally conveyed that whole thing. Yeah. Like his I but don't he didn't, care. But he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to say it and they're like just try it and then it's like all right cool wrap that's the one we're using. Let's all get out of the freezing cold water. <laughs> yeah, let's go get. Yeah, or the, like, apparently and when Harrison had, Ford and Celia Ward are in the limousine, Harrison Ford's going like, what should we do here? And she's like, shit, I don't know. Didn't they already hand us words? Aren't we supposed to say those? <laughs> and he's like, no, no, we got, we'll do some better words. We got new words. New words. Yeah. And she's like, she's like, I was 20 when, you know, Star Wars came out. Like, this guy, I had posters of him. I, like, I was on a show where we had to read all the words off the script. I didn't know we could make up words. Right. And, and, but he's just like, let's just try some different words. And she's like, okay. Yeah, dude, but I've, he, they did a great job winging it. That's all I'm Dude, saying. I, they did a great job. I, I'm sure writers would hate this podcast because I love when actors improv stuff uh, yeah. and then we hear stories about it. Not that but, there aren't great scripted movies, but, but, but I always you, love like, the improv. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Couldn't you, isn't the idea, though, to make it look real like this? This yeah. was so, I don't know, man. It was really that's one of the, It's one of the reasons why it's so real. And Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford. Um, yeah. They're really like Harrison Ford. It. We talked about this when we did Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade on Patreon. Dude, he's just so... It never seems like he's doing anything remarkable on screen, but he's also just is like a really solid, grounding, believable presence. Yeah, except like he when just he seems points. Like... <laughs> he does that point that's really good. Like when he's wagging his finger, he does that in a lot, like in a lot of his movies. Yeah. And he's really good at it. Um, my first scene is when he's in the hospital. He's like stitching himself up. I just remember that. So he's got, oh, yeah. he's like got the beard. He's like got he's like pulled off his prison jumpsuit and he's like pulling a piece of glass out of his side, stitching himself up, and then he's like he sneaks into an old man's room, this patient, yeah. he's like in his bathroom cutting his beard. Yeah. Uh, he steals the guy's freaking sandwich. And he's like lick like because he hadn't eaten, so he was super super hungry. And he was like shoveling the food in. I don't know why certain parts of this movie were burned in my brain, but him staring at the guy hoping he doesn't wake up while he was eating the stuff that fell out of the sandwich is burned into my brain. That's what I was saying. Because that, that's one of the things. Stuff. Is like I just he's like sitting at the, on the ch- like at the guy's table, just like wolfing down. Like it looked like me at Thanksgiving when it's supposed to be lunch, but you don't actually eat until four o'clock. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like I'm accidentally down. biting my own fingers, and he was just like he was getting after it. <laughs> and Dude, then also that, he, did the, he did the he did the shit like he's using the hospital scissors to cut his beard and then he uses this like regular razor to shave and every time i see someone shave in a movie i always think either i'm shaving wrong or they're shaving wrong um i don't shave anymore so i don't know i just shave the like underneath chin part but every time i see someone in movies do it they do it like they're trying to hurt themselves or like they're someone is like there's a timer on them but do, wait, well, there was a timer on him. He was hurrying. But do you use like a regular razor or you use clippers? Yeah. No, I do. Well, I use both. But I use a regular razor on my, uh, on my neck beard uh, underneath ouch. area. Ouch. I would, yeah, dude. No, when I shave, I it's like, like warm that. water and shaving cream and like long, uh, straight strokes. Like, right. And I see people right. in movies, and they're just like wailing on their own face with a razor blade. I'm like, dude, <laughs> it seems like not. If I was they acting, were chasing him, they were chasing him. He had to hurry up and zip up his cardigan and get the hell my, out of there. <laughs> my shaving acting would be so much more convincing than Harrison Ford's. Uh, all the other acting would be Harrison Ford by a landslide. But that one bit, <laughs> if we did head to head. So you think he was already shaved? And he was just dragging it over the top of nothing? He, no, he used the scissors to trim his beard real short, right. and then he shaved with the razor. But he was like, did it like yeah. he was in a hurry, and like he didn't care if he sliced his face up. Like <laughs> I he was also, like coming from multiple directions, like whipping himself in the face with the razor. <laughs> I, do, uh, I did hear that they had to like reshoot something. Um, one of the guys... Uh, they had to reshoot because the, the villain guy, uh, the actor got sick, and so they had to recast him, and then he had to right, reshoot right, his right. scene. His friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what it was. And so here's so the beard to wear, He different. had to wear a fake beard for those. I thought he grew it back out, and that's why it looked No, different. it was a fake beard. That's awesome. For that reshoot, because they didn't have that's, time for him to grow a beard back out. You can't just strain really hard? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is, uh, I feel like you would appreciate this, because this is the kind of... I feel like this is how you would make a decision. Is yeah. that Harrison Ford said that the reason he wanted to do the movie is because he wanted to grow a beard. That's a good reason. Yeah. I, I want to wear, I wear a brown cardigan. Like, <laughs> Anybody got a movie where I can wear a cardigan? Because studios are always like, no, you're Harrison Ford, dude. You're not growing a beard. You have the most recognizable face in the world. And he's like, yeah, I thought it would be fun paying, to have a beard. Paying for the face. I want to see the face. And uh, yeah. that's yeah. 
Yeah. Um, dude, my second one is uh, also when he's in the hospital, but at a different time, different hospital. Um, the kid that uh, is sitting in the hallway and he's pretending to be a janitor. Yeah. And they're all like they're over they're understaffed and just full and they need to take the kid down to a certain thing, a certain room and she asked the uh, Julian Moore asks him to roll him down there and as he's rolling off he's look, holding the, yeah, the x-ray the up to the light. Um and then he makes the change. Um that shit was awesome. Uh that was yeah. like that like how he saved the kid. Uh, showed that he was a good, like another, not that you didn't think that, but like it just shows that he was a good dude this whole time. It really humanized yeah. him. And I like that. Yeah, that's a great call, man, because that's a great scene. And specifically that moment, like he's he's infiltrated as a janitor to look up stuff with the, you know, for people who have uh, prosthetics. And right. then Julianne Moore, they're busy. And she's like, hey, janitor, take roll this kid down to level four. <laughs> hey, he's janitor. Like, <laughs> he's like, whatever, I'm on it. Whatever I can do to help the team. But he's like right. looking at the kid's x-ray and he realizes that the orders that they've written on there are wrong. And he's like – so he's like in the elevator like scratching stuff out and writing over it. And he doesn't take the kid where she told him to. He takes her to surgery and it's right. like, hey, here's this thing. Here's the clipboard. You should probably do something with that. Save the kid's life. Yeah, and saves the kid's life. It's, God, that's freaking great. And then after she catches up with him and asks him, he's like, oh, it's just a hobby. I like looking at x-rays. <laughs> like, what? That didn't work at all. Well, Julianne Moore was supposed to be in a lot more of this movie. Because yeah, she was going to be the love interest or something, yeah, right? Yeah, she's yeah. like credited really prominently. She was supposed to be his love interest, and the, the producer and the director were like, dude, the whole point of the movie is that he loves his wife. He didn't kill his wife. He's trying to prove he didn't kill his wife. We can't have him hooking up with someone while he's <laughs> on the hunt to clear his name. But the studio's like, no, he's got to make out with Julianne Moore. So yeah. like, they shot a bunch of stuff, and then they realized, like, this is not going to work. We can't do this. That's... Um Unfortunate for them, making out for nothing. Yeah, um, yeah. It I, dude, worked I out just see, fine could, for both of them. I, I could see that though. Like you don't want him. No, it would, in love that would have been terrible. Else. Like his wife just died. Well, as soon as I saw Julianne Moore, I was like, "Oh, is he going to hook up?" Because like, if you see a peripheral <laughs> character, but it's an actor that you know, you go like, "That's probably going to be a love interest." But it's like, uh, no, that doesn't. That doesn't that, make sense. He's freaking. The whole thing is how much he loves his wife and didn't kill his wife. I just pictured you sitting on the couch watching the movie. You know, it's out loud. Oh, are they going to hook up? Like that's that was that's, weird. That's what I was thinking was going to happen. <laughs> um, What's your next one? So, I had also have escaping through the tunnel. Yeah. Uh, I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. Jumps into the river. Mannequin yeah. falls face first. Dies. Right. Right. Um, and I have him in the hospital stitching himself up, stealing that guy's lunch. Right. And then my third scene is right before the scene you were talking about. Uh, I just have it as the janitor infiltration mission. Oh, dude, I like have he, that one too. Like he <laughs> did. He takes the someone's like key card, whatever thing. And he, he like goes, takes a picture of himself and he like cuts it out with an exacto knife and tapes it to the badge. By the way, what was that guy doing that he was able to steal his badge? Uh, he was like in the locker room doing something. Yeah, else. taking a shower at work. He deserves his ID taken. <laughs> Who takes showers at work, dude? If you work at a hospital, you might want to like scrub off some of the, uh, you know, fecal matter before you go home. Yeah, maybe. I, I can't just wash my hands and change my clothes. <laughs> I gotta freaking take a He's shower a at work. <laughs> maybe he needed to take. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, so he steals the guy. He steals the guy's card, modifies it so it's got his name on, it, and he wears yeah. the freaking jumpsuit and he goes in and. Um, and then he goes and looks up on the computer, like, "Hey, tell me all the people who had prosthetic arms on this arm, and they have these." And he's trying to yeah. get, he's trying to find the one arm man, right? But dude, uh, I just like like he cleans blinds exactly like I would do if that was my job. <laughs> like he's on the computer and he's got one arm with a broom, just like brushing it on the blinds, like hoping nobody notices. Dude, that was great. How because he closed the blinds so she couldn't see. Yeah, and then like as he's like clicking on stuff he's just banging the fucking blinds back and forth yeah. so that way she doesn't know what's going on yeah that's what i'm like, saying that's awesome that's and then he has to print it out and he has to press f9 to print on the <laughs> dot matrix printer yeah and it makes that very recognizable dot matrix printer sound yeah so then he really starts hitting the blinds hard <laughs> and it's going watch it watch it as it's printing out um and he tears it off it's all perforated and he stuffs it in his pocket yeah, um, yeah. Uh, I had yeah, that and one. that's and that's right before he goes up, and then Julianne Moore tells him to wheel the kid down to whatever. Right, right. Yeah, that, I had that one too. I had that one too. Nice. Um, that's weird that we both had that. I just uh, as soon as I saw the guy like, yeah, I'm gonna go take a shower. I was like, ooh, steal his ID. That guy's taking a shower at work. He's an idiot. There's a bunch of other scenes I could have picked, uh, but just those are the ones that ended up on the list. Those stood out to me too. It, but like you said, the whole thing is a long ass chase movie. Yeah. 
So well, like, dude, I liked when he made the phone call to the lawyer, and then they're listening to it on tape. The U.S. Marshals, and they're trying to argue about the train sounds. Yeah, who has an L? Yeah, elevated train. Yeah, and uh, uh, and I also like the very end when he goes to the ballroom while the guy's making a speech and he confronts him. Like that was all that could all been on there, but uh, yeah, but yeah, and he confronts him with a pointing finger. Yeah, he does the Harrison Ford finger wag. <laughs> um, let's do quotes. Give me your first yeah. quote. Uh, my first quote, we already talked about a bunch. I didn't kill my I wife. I don't care. That's the, that's the big one for me. That's the big one. Uh, yeah, it's not my favorite quote, but I did write it down because I think it is the most recognizable quote from the movie. Right. That's the one that everybody took away from. It. Like back in the 90s when people talked about Fugitive, that's what they would say. That one and then the other one is the one that uh, we've already also already talked about that was in the trailer that I talked about last week when I teased this movie. Yeah. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. Average foot speed over uneven ground barring injuries is four miles an hour. And that gives us a radius of six, six miles. miles. What I want out of each and every one of you is a hard target search for every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, in-house, outhouse, and doghouse in that area. Checkpoints go up at 15 miles. Your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. Yeah. that's I had that one also. Because I feel like that was parodied a bunch. Like I feel like I had a Mad magazine that they like made fun of that, and like it was one a SNL cracked magazine. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Those um, they parodied it pretty hard too in that Leslie Nielsen movie. <laughs> really hard. What's uh? All right. So what's your? So, other so those are my other two. My third one um, is when he first gets to that hospital where you're talking about where he's going to clip his beard and all that. Uh, he's been on the run uh, for you know a couple hours and. Um, he shows up and an ambulance is showing up and he notices that like they couldn't get the gurney legs down and he comes over to help get the gurney legs down. And he realizes it was the guy that was in the bus, the, the sheriff's, uh, sheriff's officer or whoever it was that was <laughs> yeah. watching them in the thing. And he grabs the mask and puts it back over his mouth. So he can't say, Hey, that's the guy who escaped. Um, and as they're rolling off, he's like, tell the attendant, he has a puncture in the upper gastric area. And the other guy's like, how the hell could he tell that by looking at his face? <laughs> um, I thought that was great. Like, that yeah, was, that was I, thought about, I thought about that quote, too. That was fantastic. That's the one that I put uh, as my third one. That, uh, the other one that I had was um, one that we already talked about. It was a Tommy Lee Jones improv. And he's like, what are you doing? He's thinking. He's like, well, think me up a cup of coffee and a chocolate donut with some of those sprinkles on top. Yeah, dude, that's <laughs> – God, Tommy Lee Jones is awesome. And I wonder the way if, he says is he, is you think he's fantastic. a jerk in real life? Like, or you think he's like – that? he puts it all on? Um, I feel like, I feel like people probably think he's a jerk, but he probably does not think he's a jerk. He probably yeah. thinks he's telling jokes that no one gets, but everyone's like, that guy's <laughs> such a dick. <laughs> oh man, that hit kind of hard right there. <laughs> that, that hit home pretty hard. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think he's, he's pretty, uh, he's pretty funny. I like him. Dude, he's super funny. Yeah. Uh, those are my three quotes. Yeah, good, good quotes. We had a lot of the same. That's all right. I know it's it's hard to differentiate. It's all the uh, best three characters. Number one, Tommy Lee Jones. Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, I put that on there. It um, wins an Oscar for the role. Like has yeah. all the best dialogue. Like just freaking delivers it like an absolute maniac. I mean, you know, a lot of it's improv. I mean, him the and, best lines anyway. Him and Joey Pants going back and forth are killer, dude. Yeah, so funny. Well, and they talked about because they knew each other before the movie. Is, is like Tommy Lee said that Joey Pants. He's like, "Hey, man." He's like, "We're just like let, let's have fun." If, right. if at any point during the filming of this movie we look around and we're not having fun, let's stop and fix that. Like, let's right. just have fun. Yeah, and uh, Joey Pants apparently was given an interview and said, "Like Tommy Lee Jones is like, it's not like anybody's going to win an award for this film, so like, yeah. let's just let's just get, let's just do it." Yeah, Tommy Lee um, Jones literally said to him during the filming, he's like, nobody's winning an Oscar for this one. Like, let's just go to work. <laughs> what an idiot. And then he won They killed it. Yeah. Maybe that's what it takes. Just don't care so much that you just freaking kill yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, dude. Just just don't grip it so hard. Just uh, just have a good time. <laughs> but the, all the people who played the Marshall said What are we talking about that, again? That, uh, we're talking about winning an Oscar. Oh, uh, the Oscar. Right. Right. I didn't they said that he Oscar. he was saying like you know, like you know let's let's go out to dinner let's let's have a fun time let's let's riff riff back and forth and like right. the whole like if they die the river green today why can't they die blue the other three hundred sixty four days like that's yeah. an improv yeah yeah like, like, don't let it make fun of your ponytail guy, like are just, you Irish yeah. yeah stuff like that yeah dude that's great that's great dude uh, you know what else I liked uh, and I'm sh- this might have been the script I don't know when he's um, Tommy Lee Jones thinks he recognizes Harrison Ford going down the stairs and he's like looking and he's trying to figure out if it's really him. 
and he yells his first name. What a freaking great idea. Yeah. Like yelling the person's name. I mean, I do that, but that's just because I can't remember people's names. Yeah. So I'm like, is that Kevin? Kevin. Kevin. And if he turns around, I know it's him. But if it's not, then I know it's the wrong name and I got to pick something else. Yeah. I, um, I, I like how he did that. That's a great idea. I'm a big fan of like, especially around the holidays and like around like school functions, like everyone, all the parents have to wear name tags. Cause I'm like, like people just like someone just came up to me in gymnastics and was like, Hey man, how's it going? Like I tell Wendy, I said, hello. I was like, yeah, totally, man. I'm going to do that. And I was like, I don't have any idea who that was. <laughs> hey, brown hair with the glasses told me to tell you hi. And then I'm asking nothing. Wendy, I'm like, Hey, do you know somebody? Uh, he's, uh, he's like a, he's a, He's tall. It's kind of tall. Wears Ten t-shirts. Tall. Sometimes. Uh, some of the times. Some of the times. And <laughs> and it turned out that it's a guy that every time I've met him has had a big bushy mustache and he shaved it and that's why I didn't recognize him. But, but he uh, did a few walk a though. Did all right. Did all right. Did okay. <laughs> um, dude, uh, another thing I wanted to mention about that whole scene, I forgot. The, the bullets into the bulletproof glass. Yeah. Those were wax bullets being fired into that bulletproof glass at the same time Tommy Lee Jones was firing his gun. Uh, and Tommy Lee Jones didn't want to, f- he's like, I'm, my character wouldn't put all of these people in jeopardy. I'm not going to open fire. They're like, just do it. It's going to be awesome. We're going to have a great camera angle where the bullet is going to hit right where Harrison Ford's face is to really sell the moment because his foot. Uh, and I think it worked really well. I, yeah, I agree with him. He wouldn't yeah, have opened fire. Yeah, but. Tommy Lee Jones was going like, because he was like about to run out into a crowd of people. He's like, there's no way a U.S. Marshal would just shoot a 45 into a crowd of people while he was chasing right. someone. And they're like, I know, but also it's a movie and you have to. Um, <laughs> also, do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Dude, he's great. Um, he, we talked about this when we did Under Siege last year. This, this is the same director. And yeah. Tommy Lee Jones is obviously in that movie. And he's asking the director on the set. And he's like, ah, what are you working on next? He's like, ah, I'm trying to get this uh, fugitive movie, trying to get this, like, I'm hoping to get this job. And then Tommy Lee Jones reads the script, and he's like, I'm, that sounds awesome. I want to do that, too. I want some of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And really, the director, Andy Davis, got, got the job because of how well Under Siege did once it came out. Like, after the premiere, and everyone was like, hey, this movie's actually pretty good. It's going to make some money. Right. Then he got offered the job. Yeah, yeah. That's and awesome. Harrison Ford was like, I can grow a beard. Count me in. Um, <laughs> what about the sweater? I can wear the sweater, right? <laughs> Can I can I wear a sweater? Yeah. Uh, uh, who's your next character? My next dude, Harrison Ford. Yeah, it's Harrison Ford. He's of course awesome. it is. I don't and dude, no one pops a blazer collar like Harrison Ford. <laughs> I never see him in a movie wearing a blazer where he doesn't find a way to pop the collar. Um, that's because it looks really cool on Harrison Ford. It looks gonna, way less cool on me. I was gonna say I'm glad you said on Harrison Ford because every time <laughs> I wear a blazer, I'm like maybe I try to pop the collar. I'm like, nope, that looks terrible. <laughs> It turns out uh, I'm not Harrison Ford, and this didn't uh, work at all. Yeah, dude, I don't look every time. How, this is my question. How come, and maybe it's because they don't buy their uh, stuff right off the rack and it's built for them, <laughs> but every time I'm He's like, not shopping at Dillard's. <laughs> I'm going to buy that from Kohl's, and I'm going to look like I'm in the movie, uh, and I don't look like I'm in the movie at all. I just look like I'm wearing my little brother's clothes, uh, and I don't like that. How do they, I guess, is that what it is? They just make them to, specifically for them. Yeah, dude, I guess also Harrison Ford's like 80 now and still has a six-pack, so I think that probably helps. <laughs> I have a six-pack in there somewhere. <laughs> um, dude, uh, he was really good in the interrogation scene, and then I started reading about it. Uh, he had no idea what the questions were going to be, so yeah. like all of those were like, they, they just said, like, pretend you're him, and how would you answer these questions? Go. Yeah. That's awesome. That's a, that's a great way to do that. I know I know that studios don't want to make movies this way because not having a script is obviously concerning when you're shooting yeah, a movie. But right, dude, right, right. sometimes you get if you have good actors and good directors and good editors, you can get such good stuff by going like, okay, you don't have to act because you actually are surprised by the question and you're just going to answer as your character. Right, and that's dude. And did the finger point again in the friggin' bloody t-shirt? And it was <laughs> like I don't know why that thing right there burned in my head like him going. I didn't kill my like I dude I really love it. Also, he rocked the all black K Swiss like he was a referee <laughs> did, did almost the whole time. And he had he, his referee shoes on. Yeah, throughout he, a lot he of was pull, he was pulling it off though. Um, did you know? Did you notice that he was limping through the whole movie? Yeah, because he, he actually hurt. hurt himself. Yeah, and didn't want to get surgery because he's like my character would have a limp. What an <laughs> idiot! That's awesome. Have I think you tried it would help my character's motivation. <laughs> I think it help my character's motivation if I were on fire. Um, <laughs> I can yeah, have dude. a beard, though, right? Harrison Ford's great. Uh, third character, Joey, Joey Pants. Pants for me. Yes, <laughs> obviously. I mean, yeah, Joey Pants. 
It's an God. ensemble, but he's definitely in the, the other in the oral history. The other uh, people, the other parts of the marshals. There's like four or five of them. They're going like. Joey Pants just would find a way to get into every single shot. He just yeah. figured out that if he always stood right next to Tommy Lee, he was going to be in a lot of the movie. And yeah. then because we're, we were like improving a lot of the dialogue, he could just throw stuff out there. And like he just basically forced his way into a lot of this movie by always standing next to Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, that's genius. When I, I can remember. It's totally genius. Uh, dude, when I used to be sick, I would lay on the couch and like watch movies. But I would feel bad and not want to get up and change the DVD. So then I would just like watch the whole thing again with like the commentary on. Yeah. And I can remember watching Bad Boys, the commentary, and Michael Bay being so angry because Joey Pants would do this thing where he's like, <laughs> he would block out the camera with his back. He's like, we got to, tur- you got to rotate the camera. And Joey Pants' face is going to be in the scene because he's purposely standing like an idiot to get in the scene. Dude, that's. He does that a lot, apparently, and that's yeah. awesome. Dude, that's that's the mark of an experienced actor who's never led a movie. It's like, <laughs> I'm going to be in a lot of this because that means I get more money. Yeah, he freaking killed it, though. I, why? I don't know. Could he be a leading man? Probably not, huh? Uh, probably not. I mean, he's certainly got the talent for it, but it's just not the type of person you put. Like, if you even if you go like, hey, there's a new Netflix show. It's starring Joey Pants. It's like, all right. I mean, I guess if that's awesome, I'll check it out, but I'm not. I'm not turning yeah. it on to see what he's up to. Yeah, but every yeah. time I see him, I'm like, ah, oh, freaking great. I love Joey Pants. They were all going in before you got here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, dude, he's, he's great. And, like, he's, his whole um, career is like comic relief, character actor, like third or fourth male lead. But he's so good in that spot. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, he is. No, he, he's, he is really good. Like, he, dude, he's, like, he's just your like, uh, J.J. Redick, like catch and shoot three point guy. Like, he doesn't get paid a lot. He's like your sixth or seventh man. But he's just in there, just crushing it. He is definitely crushing it. Wait, I got a I got a Joey Pants story in his words from the oral history about the very one of the very last scenes. They're like fighting in the laundromat of the hotel in the basement. Yeah, and like and the villain guy like takes a big steel I beam and like swings it on a track and yeah. it hits Joey Pants character right in the head. Yeah, and uh, and and so Joey Pant Leon says, "I go running into Andy's trailer, the director. He go and he's like he's like Andy." What the F? He's like, you can't kill me. And he goes, why? And I go, well, what if there's a sequel? And he goes, all right, all right, we won't kill you. We won't kill you. And, he, and Joey Pants is like, we shot it before CGI, so I'm thinking, I'm going to make it so that they can't make me dead. And so once the thing hits me in the head, I start moaning and making a lot of noise on the ground <laughs> so that they can never make it look like I'm dead. Uh, and apparently, uh, and then, I don't know. So, but but yeah, then the, great, director goes, story. The, the director goes, cut. And Joey Pants is like, all of a sudden I see a pair of blue jeans walk up to me, and I look the leg up. And it's Harrison Ford, and he's like, he's like, you should be dead. And I say, what if there's a sequel, Harrison? <laughs> and then Harrison laughs, and he says, well, listen, there's not going to be any sequel because I won't be in it. And then, that, and then Joey Pants goes, well, f you, who needs you? We'll just chase another twenty million dollar asshole through the woods. That's right, and, dude. And, and then but, Harrison and, Ford just falls down laughing. And then, like, he gets wheeled out of the yeah. the place on dude, the he, stretcher, he, he but they had to do it after. after. Yeah. He begs the director, like, put in a scene of me being going into an ambulance, like, so that everyone knows. And both Harrison Ford and Tommy Lee Jones was like, we don't need, can we just, can you just do that after we leave? Like, don't, <laughs> I don't want to be part of that. They were all separate because they didn't uh, want that. But God, I just, I love that this guy's, the whole movie, he's just like throwing out quips. He's try, he's always like grabbing onto Tommy Lee Jones's uh, elbow, like a, like a toddler, just trying to make sure he's right there. And then at the end when he <laughs> me takes too, right, freaking, guys? Yeah, me too. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in this. And then... He takes a freaking steel eye beam to the head, but he's like moaning and writhing around so that everyone knows he's alive. <laughs> and then they do the big white wrap of uh, stuff <laughs> around his head. That's freaking great. That's it's amazing. Great. All right. Same characters for everybody. Writer, directors, uh, stuff. Yeah. Um, Andrew, Andrew Davis is the guy who did it. We did, Andrew like Davis. you said, in, Under Siege. Yeah. That's, uh, that's awesome. Um, I don't really know any, uh, like, I know Chain Reaction after that with uh, Morgan Freeman and uh, what's his name? Uh, yeah. Keanu? Viacondias. Uh, yeah, Viacondias. And I've seen Collateral Damage with what you call it. Collateral I don't Damage. Rem- I don't know any of the other ones. Oh, yeah. Holes. I never saw Holes. I yeah, put, Holes. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. I didn't highlight that one. I missed it. Uh, but what about before that? Like, Above the Law was a uh, Seagal movie, and there's a Chuck well, yeah, Norris he did, movie. He did a couple of... He, did, he was doing, like, action, but, like, kind of low-rent, like, B action movies with, like, Chuck Norris and Steven Seagal. And then Under Siege takes off. And it's right. a huge movie in 92, and then they go, the studio goes, well, he probably can do another action movie. They give him The Fugitive. That's also a huge movie. And then, um, 
And his next movie, Steel Big, Steel Little, in 1995, starring Andy Garcia and Joey Pants. Joey Pantaleon. But he takes two years off, and he does a comedy, and then doesn't really do well. And then he does Chain Reaction, which also doesn't do well. And then I think that's kind of it for him. Yeah, I mean, yeah. He's, he's got credits on his Wikipedia page that I would kill to have. But, like, this, is, right. this movie right now is the peak of his directorial career from, like, commercial and, like, uh, you know, awards success. Yeah, yeah. Um, what about the the writers? There's Jeb uh, Jeb Stewart. Yeah, he Jeb Stewart. Die Hard. He uh, so he, Jeb Stewart was the writer that was on the set. So the original s- script, the original adaptation was by a guy named David. Um, uh, I never know how to pronounce this last name. T W O H Y. Yeah. Toy. I, I don't know. Toy. Toy is how um, I would say. He does the ori- original adaptation. They're trying to get this movie made for ten years. So he's the one who takes the. The, he watches all the episodes of the Fugitive TV show, all 60-whatever, and then tries to make it, make it fit into a feature film. Right. And they go like, hey, great, thanks for that. Here's your money. Here's your credit. Go home. We're going to hand it off to a bunch of other writers. And then when they go to actually start production, Jeb Stewart, who wrote Die Hard, is the guy actually on the set. So he's the guy like, tomorrow we shoot the – he's calling him from the payphone, and he's underneath the L. I got to write that scene tonight. He's doing right. that. Right, right. But then everyone's like – Everyone is working on it. The producer and the director and the actors is like, we're about to shoot the scene. You're going to say this, and then I'll say whatever back. That's um, that's ridiculous that that's how they did it, though. I know. That's but also, crazy. Uh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's another... The, um, there's something else. The, the Switch Switchback movie? It had Danny Glover, and I used to love that movie. And then I watched it. It had, like, Jared Leto in it, and... Um, that was one of the ones that Jeb Stewart wrote. Um, Dennis Quaid, I went back and watched it. It is god-awful. Yeah. But that's uh, the first one he directed. Yeah. That, that I, don't, was I don't know first anything one about directed. that. Yeah. He, and he I, that's all I have for the writers and the directors. The main thing is just like this thing had to come together so fast, and they were kind of making it up on the fly, and it just is one of those times that it worked out. It, it definitely worked out. It definitely worked out. I have some stuff about the extra, the other actors that were in this that we haven't talked about yet, just because there were so many random good people in this like uh did you see who the um the the guard was and the prison guard that lived through the train wreck yeah that was, that was uh from that's, office space yeah richard that's richard riley who's placed tom smikowski i deal with the goddamn customers so the engineers don't have to i'm a people person i have people <laughs> skills yeah i freaking love that dude he's awesome <laughs> he's awesome and uh, he's like making up a story. He's making up a story because actually it was Harrison Ford that saved his partner. And they're like, "You're kind of a hero." And he's like, "Well, you know, he's my partner who done the same for me." Uh- <laughs> <laughs> that guy uh, is fantastic, uh, dude. I noticed the uh, janitor was on the train. Yep, Neil Flynn. Janitor was on the train. Yeah, janitor um, from Scrubs. Neil Flynn was on the was on the uh, was on the uh, train. Did you see who one of the reporters was when he was asking about the uh, the order stuff was happening? Uh, uh, no. That was that was the report. The reporter was the uh, psychiatrist from Groundhog's Day. Nice Groundhog Day that has. Uh, I have an alcoholic now. That guy, um, <laughs> and then uh, the guy Bones that gave him the blood samples. That was the from Groundhog Day. Also, he was the uh, sweet vermouth on the rocks. He was the bartender. The that bartender. Gave him that. Yeah, I recognize that guy. I forgot to look up his name. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, also uh, Jane Lynch is in this. Jane uh, Lynch. She's from, like the working in the lab doing some yeah. blood draw stuff. Killing it. Killing um, it. I love her. Julia Moore we talked about. Um, dude, I found I found one that I thought... I was actually watching the credits because I watched the credits to see if there's anybody I recognize. And um, I looked up... Because I, I was watching the credits and I just saw... I was like, oh, I'm going to look that up. And uh, it was the his attorney, um, Richard Kimball's attorney. It was a guy yeah. named uh, Dick Cusack. And I was like, Cusack? They filmed this in Chicago. Uh, guess who that is? No idea. That is an actor... Uh, Richard Dick Cusack, who is the father of three actors named John, Joan, and Anne Cusack. Bless, that's awesome. Yeah, I had no idea that that uh, there was there. Is their dad an actor, or he yeah. just happened to be in that? Yeah, he's an actor. He didn't do uh, a lot of stuff, but right. uh, but he like he's he's an actor. He's got some credits, and I looked him up. And I was like, yeah, he did some stuff. And that's nothing like awesome. freaking John Cusack, but uh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I had was, no uh, idea. How did you? How did that guy look familiar to you? He didn't look familiar to me at all. Oh, I was watching oh, I the credits you. and I oh, saw the I name got you Cusack, the and I was like, "They yeah. filmed this in Chicago. I'm gonna go look up and just see if he's related." I got and, you, and it's his dad. It's Dude, the, the credits dad. were weird for me. Like, 
uh, the, like over the first like 15 minutes of the film, they start. And then after like two minutes, they stop for a bit. And then as soon as he gets back, like he's chained and getting on the bus, the credits start again. And I thought yeah, that was, was weird. weird. But I, I, and I read about that too, because they, in the initial cut of the movie, it was like a half an hour longer. And there was 30 minutes of like backstory before he ever started like being a fugitive. Uh, and the editors were going like, man, we can't have 30 minutes, but it's called the fugitive. It can't be 30 minutes of him not being a fugitive. Like it was a whole like day in the life. Like he went to a fashion show and he was going to dinner and he was like, and so they decided to do the murder of his wife as flashback in the credits. That and they was did cool. like They did it like in black and white. So I think that was maybe why the credits were a little chopped up. I like the black and white idea too because that made the blood not look as bad. That's what they said. They're like, it was really gruesome, the, the scenes of her being murdered. So it was like, we did black yeah. and white. So it like, kind of wasn't so in your face. Like, God, yeah, that's, that's awesome. really good. That's really that's good awesome. editing. Um, that's good stuff. I like yeah, it. The only other bonus good that I have is uh, the that we should say something about the train wreck sequence. Did you look up any stuff about that? Well, I saw that they, uh, they actually did it. Yeah. Um, They used a real train and the, just, just to do it one time cost over a million dollars. And so they like, they knew they were only going to be able to do it once. Right. I mean, it's a, it's a practical sequence featuring an actual train crashing into a bus and catching on fire. So they're like, and that, that train set up all the cameras because we got to get this. We got to get this. Got to get it on the first try. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it's still uh, sitting there. They found like an abandoned section of train track and like, we'll just do We'll just ram this stuff into each other and then it'll explode. That's freaking cool. How do you even yeah. get the train on that part of the track? Um, I don't know. I guess you probably can like put it on a truck and haul it over there. But they... Uh, that's crazy. No wonder well, the, it's a million dollars. The, the effects guys were saying, I watched like one making of thing on the train wreck, and they yeah, were like, yeah. they're like, to get the actual train and then to wreck it, like if, it, the, if the train doesn't run, which this one didn't, like they had to push it from behind. Right. They're like, the train is cheaper than building the miniature of the train would be. That's crazy. Like actually buying the train. I was like, sweet, that's awesome. That's crazy. Uh, and it's one of the things the director was saying, like if you did the movie now, you do all that stuff in CGI, and as much as it, was expensive to have a million dollar train wreck. It would cost way more to do it digitally. Yeah. Cause you'd have like, yeah. you know, 300 people working on it. God, that's, uh, who's the guy who uses all the miniatures now? Oh, uh, Wes Anderson uses a lot of miniatures. Yeah. He does. A, he did a train miniature in his new one. I, dude. And that shit looks super expensive. So I don't know how, yeah. How the actual train could be cheaper. That's crazy. Well, I think that's, that's one of the things that's weird to me is that this movie's, they made it for $44 million, obviously 30, years ago but still even if we account for inflation and we go it would cost 90 million dollars now there's no way you could do this for 90 million dollars no, now no um why is because that? i think because they shot on location and they use practical effects and so they yeah. have to figure out so the, like, and they i read that they just asked the the mayor of chicago hey can we uh film during the parade yeah yeah, and dude, they, they just, shot during the actual parade. Like they, they didn't just give had a steady cam guy walking through the parade following Harrison Ford. Yeah, and and Harrison they didn't give him any they gave him direction. They just said like, "Hey, you're a fugitive, you're chasing him, ready go." Yeah. So that was like their real reactions. That's crazy. That's crazy. Well, there was a uh, I I damn it, I lost the note that I had. There was another movie that f- was filming during that same parade and so they had what? to like block out like, "We're on this block, you guys are on this block, don't shoot towards us because we don't want to see your people." And um that's I, I, nuts. I lost what movie it was. That's awesome. Yeah. He he did, like, as soon as he grabbed that hat from the trash, though, he, like, blended right in. Yeah, and I think they, I saw somewhere, I don't know if it's true or not, but I saw that, that was an improv that Harrison Ford just, like, saw that hat, grabbed it out of a trash can, popped it on, and was, like, good to go. God. Freaking staple it to his head like Indiana Jones. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, dude, that's the last thing I got for the best. I want to make sure we talk about how, I mean, that's, I think is probably the best train wreck accident absolutely uh, like ever caught on film yeah and the harrison ford jumping i know that you could tell that was like imposed over the top of it but like yeah like a composite. i still thought it looked pretty good Dude, it looked great and that's an iconic shot too yeah it is yeah it is um yeah i don't have any other good uh not any other good that we want to all talk right. about yeah that's all the best let's go to the worst i didn't have a lot of worst man the only thing i had was I thought it was weird, like, right after you're saying, like, oh, he's got a puncture wound on his upper chest. And it's like, how can you tell that from looking at his face? Yeah. And then he's, but he's, like, he's kind of home free, and then he decides to steal an ambulance, which is, like, the least inconspicuous vehicle ever made. Like, I didn't right. understand why he did that. Because he's yeah. such a smart guy. But does he know how to, like, 
Hotwire a car? I don't. I would have well, to steal something. He's in keys Chicago. Out. You don't need a car. You could just walk yeah, and then true. get on the train. Wait, was and he I'm, in Chicago there? He wasn't in Chicago there. He's trying to get to Chicago, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe so. Uh, maybe I thought he was in, in a rural yet. area. I don't, yeah, know. I don't know. I don't but know. I was trying to figure out why he was stealing the, the ambulance. And I was yeah, like, maybe that's... he just, maybe the guy, maybe he knew the guard recognized him and he thought he needed to like get away from there really fast. Faster, if, you're gonna right. steal, if you're a fugitive and you're stealing a car, an ambulance is one of the worst ones to steal. Yeah, you got to steal a freaking Camry or something. Yeah, so. dude, steal a freaking brown Ford Taurus. Right, right, fine. right. Blend right in. Um, yeah, the, the worst that I had, uh, the Polish guy that gives up uh, Kimball, that he was staying in his mom's uh, basement or whatever. Right. He was super dirty. I know he was probably supposed to, but he was gross. <laughs> that was uh, he was very well cast because I could tell uh, as soon as he appeared on screen, I was like, "That guy's creepy as hell." <laughs> yeah, he definitely touches little girls. Um, <laughs> also, for worst effects, uh, he gets in the elevator and presses uh, twenty four, but twenty five lit up, um, and that bothered me. But you know, whatever. <laughs> That's, That's a great fine. catch. I definitely it's, missed that. It's, it's totally fine. Uh, the other bonus bad that I had was uh, she was throwing rose petals all on the floor. Yeah. Um, and I would be the person that would have to clean that up. Uh, so I definitely don't want rose petals on the floor. I'm no good afterwards. I'm like a bear that got shot with a trank. So I am not like, hey, let's go sweep up the petals. Like, I'm out. So don't I, look, do that. I, I understand when like uh, when a guy's going to like throw down some rose petals to try to get his wife in the mood. But it's yeah. when it's a woman doing it to a man, like, I'm just <laughs> saying as a man, that's not necessary. Yeah. Throw some chicken wings or something all over it. <laughs> Yeah, you could just say, like, hey, do you want to go to the bedroom? And then, like, waggle one eyebrow. I'm like, oh, sweet. It's on. Um, I don't need any rose petals. <laughs> no rose it's... petals or candles. Maybe some music. <laughs> some music, possibly. Um, uh, dude, uh, one more thing. Uh, are all parades that aren't Mardi Gras suck so bad? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think they're mostly like, uh, here comes the, you know, the freaking Rotary Club. They, they're all going to wave at you. Uh, yeah, no one, who wants... No one throws anything. No one's yeah, drunk. what is it's up terrible. with that? I mean, I don't yeah. even like catching stuff. But if I'm going to go, I want them to at least try to get me to catch stuff. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't. Yeah. I didn't like... I don't like other parades. Um, worst effects? I, dude, I didn't have... I thought the effects in this movie were incredible. Yeah, they really were. They really were. I, I enjoyed it. Old uh, tech? A lot. Dude, fax machines, pay phones, Binaca spray. Phones. Yeah. But, is that oh, what's good? Binaca. Binaca. Yeah. yeah. And also they're when they were tra- yeah, when they were trying to um, isolate the sound from the L, and he had a huge like reel to reel tape machine. And he was like just in the yeah, that's not just how that works. Levers. By yeah, the way, no, it's but not. he was like he was like trying to do some EQ stuff so he could only hear the background voice. But that's how you know uh, Deputy U.S. Marshal Sam- Samuel Gerard has no idea how it works because yeah. he's just like, "Can you isolate that for me?" And he's like, "Yeah, I guess so." He's, he's like, "Can what? you zoom in and enhance?" <laughs> enhance. <laughs> Uh, political incorrectness. I actually like that they made a made a point to make sure that the U.S. Marshals had like people who look like older people and like a Younger woman, and then also woman, people of color yeah. and like yeah, yeah. It's supposed to be a diverse crowd. And they were saying like the th- the studio was like, dude, just just give them a sidekick. Tommy Lee and Joey Pants. It's all we need. It's like no, no. It's got to be a group of them like working together yeah. as a team. That's the whole thing yeah, they're yeah. doing. I like how too when they were undercover and they were walking and they were like. Uh, revealing each other's U.S. Marshal sign, how it's like oh, yeah. built into their undercover clothes, dude. Like in their like homeless outfits and their like street sweeper outfits. That was awesome. Yeah, that's that cool. a great touch. Yeah, um, cameos we kind of talked about though, huh? Yeah, yeah. I think we covered uh, yeah. five questions. Is it okay yeah. for kids? Uh, I say ten, ten and above, because yeah. the blood in the beginning is uh, what you call it. It's uh, black and white, so I think yeah. it's all right. Yeah, I Did mean, Jake, watch this with you? Uh, no, nobody watched it with me, but like. I think he could have watched it and been right. okay. I don't know if it would have kept his interest, but I think it'd be okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, would this movie get made if it were pitched now? Honestly, man, I wouldn't. I don't think I'd be excited if they said they were going to reboot this, but you absolutely could. The story if, still works, and it would well, still what, be awesome. What if you did like another, not The Fugitive, but like you just did like, hey, we're going to make another U.S. Marshals. Tommy Lee Jones, unfortunately, still has to work. Dude, I don't, I don't think that anyone Marshall. would be excited about a U.S. Marshals sequel. I think if you said, like, we're going to reboot The Fugitive, probably some people would be like, hell yeah. But it's the same thing, right? It is, but one of those movies was amazing and one of those movies was shitty, I think is yeah. the difference. Oh, man, now I've got to go back and watch the U.S. Marshals because I don't remember it being shitty. I'm not saying I thought it was right, shitty, right, but I'm right. saying, like, people this one, was, this one right. made almost $400 million and U.S. Yeah, yeah. Marshals made $100 million. Right, right. That's a big difference That's when you make shit. movies for money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, uh, so I, I think this should—I think this should absolutely get made. It seems like 
dude, we should definitely, if we're doing white men can't jump again, we should definitely do this again. Uh, agreed. Agreed. Um, TV or movie? Well, it's been both and it worked as both, but I kind of like yeah. the, I kind of like the movie. Yeah. Movie. Cause it was tight and done and really yeah. quickly. Yeah. I liked it. Yeah. The uh, TV show was like a quantum leap thing where it's like every right. week he's in a different town solving a different problem. Like that's yeah, kind of yeah. fun, but I don't know if a TV show like that would work as well anymore. Yeah. Dude. Even like the more recent ones, like burn notice every time it's like, well, we can give you this information, but all you gotta do is help my friend first. And then yeah. he has to help the friend for the whole episode. It's um, it's super formulaic. Even though it can be fun, it's like yeah, right. you're, it's all, they're all doing. That's the same why thing. I want I want movie. Uh, did you recast it, um, dude? I was I, I was thinking of it, but I was like, well, we already did it. I'm like, I was trying to think. I'm like, I'm like I want to want a uh, not white actor in the lead, but I was like, there I know so little about people who are acting now. I was like. Yeah, like, I guess Michael B. Jordan. I've had to, I put him in like every single thing, <laughs> which is what's happening in real life. I have He's like three black friends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, I I went. Uh, I have like um, I don't know seven people that I recast. Are you ready for him? Yeah, dude. Doctor Richard Kimball, Sasha Baron Cohen, in his first role. That's not goofy, because <laughs> he could really he could. I think he could uh, do serious, and I think he would kill at it. Um, like when Robin Williams went serious. Yeah, well, that I would have not thought of it if you'd not said that. But now that you did say that, it makes me think that because I just saw Oppenheimer again today. Uh, Remy Malik could would be awesome at that. Yeah, he's way good at everything. Yeah, that, that in really Oppenheimer good. where he's just like a background character, but carrying the whole thing. Ah, it is it's awesome. Speaking uh, of which, Oppenheimer in seventy millimeter IMAX is fantabulous. Yeah, I bet it was. Um, all right, uh, Sam Gerard played by Dwayne the Johnson Rock. Because uh, I hmm. feel like he can be um, sarcastic. Because I, I feel like he's funny, and he would be the guy that everybody comes to see the movie for. Yeah, he's got good comic timing, but I don't think he can be. If you Sam, had to improv a lot of stuff, I don't think he can't yeah, be Tommy Lee Jones. Yeah, you yeah. gotta hand him a tight script, right? But right. Yeah, but he can uh, deliver a funny line. Speaking of delivering funny lines, his sidekick Cosmo Rimfro, played by Joel McHale. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I just really like that guy. Dude, Joe um, McHale is awesome. Yeah. I can't believe uh, you're not going to have Kevin Hart be his sidekick, though. Give, give, me, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, I Don't. had Kevin Hart in there, but I changed it because I didn't want Kevin Hart in there because they are in all the movies together. I know. Uh, all right. The bad guy that's uh, the one-armed man is played by Jared Leto because uh, he's freaky, and that guy was freaky. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, 100% believe Jared Leto going to get a perm. And being as creepy as that guy wearing a trench coat. Yeah, dude, I'm convinced that, well, I think that's out there publicly that he is actually super creepy. But yeah, it's not I surprising to me at all. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Charles Nichols, uh, who is Dr. Richard Kimball's friend, uh, is played by Chris Tucker. Because um, <laughs> he played a really good, um, funny, but also kind of serious in Air, the Michael Jordan movie. I know. And I, God, he's so good. I, I, I liked it. Uh, Bobby Biggs, the other U.S. Marshal, is played by Craig Robinson. Uh, cause he's hysterical. Uh, Noah, the guy with the ponytail is now a girl. It's Angie Harmon. Uh, she's older and she's about ready to retire. Uh, and, uh, the I'm getting female, too old for this shit, <laughs> the female, the female deputy, uh, is played by Jada Pinkett Smith. Nice. seems like that cast is way older than this cast, but I guess maybe not. No, it's, they, they are, they are, uh, all of those people are in their forties and fifties. Uh, because I like, you can tell how old Joey Pants is in this movie. Yeah, he's already balding. Like, I, yeah, he's definitely he, wearing a hairpiece. He could be any age, right? I, I like how in your uh, recasting, the marshals are so old that they're not going to be able to run after people. They're just going to have yeah. to kind of walk fast. Like, hold on a second, I can't. I got. They don't. They don't need a to tweaky run after hamstring. People. They don't have to run after people. Yeah, they're good. Um, I don't know. I just started with the the age, and then I just went from there, and I just kind of kept it all all older. Um, this would be a fun movie to recast, honestly, because the U.S. like you get you plug in whoever for the Harrison Ford part, any any kind of leading man, and then yeah. the Marshals is like who's a group of five people of different ages and genders and colors that and races that looks like they would be really funny hanging out in a room together, right? And then I, just do, off you could, go. Could you not see Sasha Baron Cohen just changing into all the disguises that he uses for his other shows? <laughs> like that would be great. I uh, I actually would really like to see Sasha Barn Cohen do a real, like a, do like a Safdie Brothers like Adam Sandler movie where he's actually acting and he's not just playing a character because I think right. he'd be good at that. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think so too. 
Uh, but that's all I got. Nice. That's awesome. Can you still watch and enjoy this in 2023? Um, yeah, yeah, it was killer. Yeah, it's, I really liked it. It still is really good. I watched it at home, and then when I was doing my notes, I did it again at school uh, during a break with the speakers turned up really loud. It was great. Yeah. Yeah, highly recommend. It's streaming on... Um, Don't say the, it. The oh, app, no, it's on Max. The app formerly known as HBO Max. It's now just, it's just Max. Max. I thought for sure it was going to be on Peacock. And we it's not on Peacock, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately... For yeah. everyone involved. Yeah. Um, you know, it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah, man. What's the next episode? Next, next episode, episode is... Uh, for Love or Money. Oh, man. Michael J. Fox. God bless. I can't wait. I feel like I watched that in the last five years, but I'm excited to watch it again. I definitely did not, and I can't wait to watch it I again. think I, I, want, I went through the, like, 90s Michael J. Fox movies. Probably, it, it was probably more than five years ago, but I watched freaking Life with Mikey and For Love or Money and all that stuff. This, uh, yeah, I can't wait for this one. This is great. Um, and that's nice. episode 18. Can you believe it? 18? It's just happening so fast. So um, they, they all right. grow up so fast. Thank you guys for listening. Feel free to check out bonus movies on Patreon. Uh, Field of Dreams just came out. Next up on Patreon will be When Harry Met Sally. And then we'll be back here uh, in delightful. the main feed in two weeks with For Love or Money and Via Con Dios. Via Con Dios. Thanks for listening to Movie Life Crisis. Please subscribe, rate, and review, and remember, don't drive angry.